What's up, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Theory Underground Tour Van 2023. Uh, I'm your cameraman, not exactly your host, David McCarricker, aka Dave the Slave. In the back, Dave we've got and the man and the man and uh, Ryan. That's Ryan. Ryan Gosling. And Ryan. The gods. We got the, the, the gods. The and today, your real host and reader. The subject of this entire thing here is gonna be Nance No Pants. He could just be Nance Gavin Nance. Oh, Nance yeah, Gavin Nance. Gavin Nance. Nance. Yeah, Nance Gavin Nance. That's right. We just smuggled oranges into California. Well, I mean, accidentally. We don't have oranges in here, do we? All right, what, what is today's reading? Where's the oranges? Uh, today we're gonna be reading the introduction and maybe the first few essays of Underground Theory. Um, so, Hopefully we can get this up in a timely manner so that all of you people out there in TV land um, who have the book and who are excited but don't have time to read everything, um, you can still consume um, some of the book. And maybe, who knows, maybe eventually we'll knock out this whole thing in audiobook form. Um, that is the goal. And actually, yeah, that's not a maybe. That is the, the goal is eventually to have the whole thing up. I mean, the dedication is to who? Workers with earbuds. Workers with earbuds. So right. this is for you. Thank you. We love you. Um, steal shit from your boss. Steal shit from your job. Um, write books while you're on the toilet. Write books on the toilet. That's Show what I late. did. Read Zizek on your break. Yeah. During your shift. And don't ask for time off. Take it. Don't ask. Take it. Yeah. Say, hey, I've got family and friends. Unlike you, my manager. I'm yeah. doing it. We're a family together. We're a team together. Everyone achieves more. You're like, no, nah, bitch, I have a real family. I'm going to go spend time with it. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, the introduction is by yours truly. Uh, and so basically the first two essays after the introduction, is going to be uh, Anne and then Nance's pieces. I don't know if they'll be standalone videos or all part of this one, but we'll, we'll get going. We'll get going. This is the sentence that opens the book. It was supposed to be something special, but sometimes you just need to get straight into things. What things? Well, first of all, let's clear up any confusion. Underground theory is the name of this book, but theory underground is the name of a critical media theory experiment that is, is sort of one man, co one person college, social media app and publishing house. It's my baby. I consider it an opportunity to hone my own abilities, experiment with new media forms, and collaborate with friends and fellow travelers in the world of underground theory. The goal of Theory Underground is to develop educational content for and connect with people who see no future in what is on offer today, but who nonetheless want to raise the bar that has been lowered by academic institutions who serve profit and the pursuit of career advancement as their ultimate end. Movements from the history of underground music emerge from rich contexts of artists experimenting with new media forms in an attempt to better express their moment. They break away from the suffocating and stultifying mainstream to do what they love, regardless of the cost. <sighs> Underground theorists do similarly in experimenting with new media forms and modes of organizing so as to revolutionize understanding in the fields of knowledge. This can be good and bad because a lot of self-styled gurus and charlatans necessarily emerge from the influencer sphere. In leaving academia, they end up abandoning standards and legitimacy altogether. One can leave academia to try to save oneself, but nonetheless sell out to the attention economy's algorithms. Giving in to market pressures results in a loss of purpose and integrity. One of the goals of Theory Underground is to counter the worst tendencies of the attention economy. Theory Underground aims to raise the standards on ourselves so that we can rise to genuine challenges that were only fame at our overly administered universities. What lies beneath the ground? The word underground has many connotations, adventure, danger, marginalization, and creation. Though it has always been the case that those who are burnt out with or see no future in the above ground flock to the underground as an exciting and edgy reprieve from the repressive expectations, obligations, and law of society. The underground is not something to glorify uncritically. Its negative connotations include abandonment, exile, crime, addiction, and violence. Light and darkness are interdependent, but civilization has lifted light to the level of true and good, repressing everything associated with darkness to the level of evil. The Nietzschean, Bataillon, Landian, Punk, 
hardcore and rap tendencies are to take tarrying with the negative to its hyperbolic limit. Gigi Allen is, is the archetype of this limit, the punk rock star, known for beating the shit out of fans, raping audience members on stage, and throwing his excrement everywhere. Everywhere an underground scene opens up, the social super ego, ego will infiltrate, <laughs> a new order will get erected, and then from those conditions will arise the likes of a Nick Land or Gigi Allen, who take transgression to a point that breaks the pretense and exposes the posers for what they are tourists and lifestyle consumers. For those unfamiliar with Nick Land's notorious transgressive style, this is the kind of thing he was writing in his ostensibly leftist days. Christ screams on the cross, Father, your parsimony disgusts me. Is this a death? He thinks of the abortion he missed, lying wrapped in bloody rags on the floor of a cheap hostelry. He is excited by the thought of his mother in mortal sin and of a harsher love than he ever knew. How was it possible for her to forego the delight of hacking God's fruit from her womb? That was a chance for religion. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Pretty edgy, yeah? This is why I see land as the Gigi Allen of theory. Proximity to filth, crust, disease, and cruelty thus gets raised to the level of social and cultural capital. Upward mobility in transgressive countercultural circles can thus commodify the signifiers of self-harm, ritual abuse, and gore for its own sake. If one's transgression is really just wrapped up in the jouissance of shocking the sensibilities of polite society, then its thirst for annihilation will go far beyond blasphemy in more traditional senses, which is why land moved on to greener pastures of shock, coining the term neo-reactionary dark enlightenment and dabbling in race realism. Edginess feels real when nothing else does. The domesticated suburbanite animal of middle-class America, caged by a schooling system that reduces its vital time energy to instrumentalized labor power, which qualifies that labor power on the basis of how well the subject succeeds or fails in having its libidinal economy incorporated into the structure of rewards and punishments, screams out for something, anything, real. Real is that which cannot be incorporated into the sanitized, structured, ordered, and beautiful world of appearances, perceptions, and commodity relations. The real is the realm of trauma. As Gigi Allen says, I am the real. Rape, genocide, serial killers, and addiction thus get raised to the level of idols by countercultural consumer fandoms. Those disenchanted with their privilege and the fakeness of the world watch American Psycho, Clockwork Orange, and Solo, or the 120 Days of Sodom on repeat. Is this real shit? How about videos of Mexican cartel cartels peeling the faces off of its torture victims? What about ISIS beheadings? Don't forget faces of death. Underground shit always has these niche, niche corners of fascination with the worst aspects of human nature. Everything we are not allowed to talk about wants to come out to play. The underground is opened by those who feel a roiling madness at the hypocrisy of the hyper-sanitized and overproduced corporate middle-class illusion. Whatever spits in the face of all that and says, you're actually no better than the filth you repress by force, has potential to get lifted to the level of an underground idol. It is not rare to find suicide getting glorified too in the underground. Is it because so many involved have already gone through a sort of symbolic suicide that got them shut out of mainstream in the first place? Is it because what Sean Middlestat calls future trauma in this volume? It's also because suicide is the place where absolute self-possession, freedom, and transgression of morality and law all meet in a singular act that cannot be exchanged. This is why Baudrillard thought seriously about its radical potential to cap counter capital. Gigi Allen promised to kill himself on stage as the grand culmination of his project, which would have been the most extreme manifestation of his autonomy. But instead, he died from overdose, a slave to his appetites. The Suicide Boys made a suicide pact that, if they did not make it in the hardcore rap underground, then they would both kill themselves. Though they made it, they have nonetheless had to struggle with being possessed by drug addiction, feeling like they lose control. Poppin' Oxy, snorting Roxy, body feeling like a zombie, never been a role model, never hear me say I'm sorry. I've been suicidal with them drugs up, up in my mama's womb, all these poppies cocked a shoddy barrel pressed against my body. 
to have the barrel pressed against your body because you have lost control to, to drugs and fame is not the same kind of suicidal as the being towards death that makes a suicide pact as a radical act of autonomy and rejection of the status quo. But these two kinds of suicidal ideation get mixed up in the underground. Suicide from misery and loss of control is not equivalent to choosing when and how to exit. This is the contradiction within which Mumble and SoundCloud rappers find themselves today. Drugs as escape, but escape as loss of control. Being honest about this contradiction and tarrying with it to the best of one's ability has become key to success and early death, as with Juice World, who, like Lil Peep, was well aware of what was coming. If it wasn't for the pills, I wouldn't be here. But if I keep taking these pills, I won't be here. Yeah. Mitch Luker of deathcore band Suicide Silence is another example. He lived on the edge and made himself a sacrifice for all the millions of teenagers who felt he needed to hear his me who felt who he felt needed to hear his message. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to throw a fit. It's okay to freak out. People feel so much pent up anger. They just need something to happen. When they hear my music, it triggers something, and you never know what's going to happen. You might punch someone in the face. You might. Ellipsis. I love that line. Yeah. You might punch someone in the face. Oh, I'm getting a call from the rental. Oh. Okay, one second. We're back. back. One of Suicide Silence's most famous, famous songs is about suicide. No Pity for a Coward has two major interpretations. Either it tells people who make fun of suicidal people to just kill themselves, or it tells people who say they are suicidal but don't go through with it to just go through with it. As the famous line goes, seconds from the end, what's it going to be? Pull the trigger, bitch. Why is this empowering? Because fuck your past, your future is in your hands. Suicide is suggested as radical autonomy. Don't be a coward. If you need to get out of this life, then get it over with. But if you are going to live, then the future is in your hands. But the contradiction in play here between one, a radically transgressive and empowering act versus being enslaved to one's addictions or self-negating habits manifests itself perfectly in Mitch Luger's tragic story. Everything he did, all of the relentless touring, writing, and recording, was done for his daughter. But his wife couldn't stop him from jumping on that motorcycle on the night of November 1st, 2012. If his family truly came first, and the mental health of his fans second, then what role did riding his motorcycle while sloppy drunk play? Luker lost control of his black 2013 Harley Davidson in Huntington Beach at 8.55 p.m. on Halloween night and slammed into a Main Street light pole, police said in a news release. He died Thursday at University of California, Irvine Medical Center. All real fathers sacrificed to raise a healthy family. This means balancing the pleasure principle with the reality principle. If we are truly rational creatures who seek the ideals we rationalize as our main motivations, then everything is a balancing act between the necessary constraints of, of reality and the desire for a harmonious equilibrium for ourselves and our loved ones. But as Freud discovered late into his career, there is something beyond the pleasure principle. While Mitch Luger, Gigi Allen, and the Suicide Boys all have their conscious ego relation to the concept of suicide as a radically autonomous act, they're nonetheless split subjects like the rest of us. Death Drive and Chewy Songs. We have the desire to live a peaceful and successful life, but all of our desires seek release in whatever outlets they get hooked into. Drive gets hooked on outlets that provide the subject Chewy Songs. Chewy Sons is the feeling of intensity, exhilaration, drama, and risk, which threatens to overturn everything good we have going for us. Where you get your Chewy Sons is not fully in your own control. How one's libidinal economy forms is unconscious and largely based in formative experiences, traumas, and how we find ways of coping with these realities. Take Gigi Allen again as the case in point. Raised without running water or electricity by a religious fanatic father who threatened to kill him and his brother and mother, when his mother tried to escape, his father kidnapped and beat them. His life was a secluded living hell for 10 years before his mother succeeded in escaping with him and getting a divorce. Is it any surprise that going through puberty, Alan's first sexual experience was with his brother, or that he developed a fetish for smelling his mother's used feminine products, masturbating to the contents of toilets, and seeking out violence in every form? He said those early years made him strong with a warrior's soul so that he was better prepared to face anything and get what he wants. While he was not quite a feral child, he was pretty close to one. Feral children are, by definition, creatures who only resemble humans. They lack the integration into language 
in subjectivization and socialization that require, to some degree, the internalization of law and its known. When your father prohibits everything, when law becomes synonymous with the absolute limitation on any possibility for freedom, how is one to develop a moral compass? It is possible only as a miracle. What I am saying is a sort of secular version of there but for the grace of God go I. My own upbringing could have broken my moral compass entirely, causing me to lose complete touch with the distinction between right and wrong. When the big other is so oppressive that superegoic forms of inherent transgress transgression are not enough to make the existing system of rules tolerable, or when inherent transgression is itself rendered impossible as a form of enjoyment, it is easy to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Whether this was ever a choice or just dumb luck that put me on a path with a little more nuance and less harm is a philosophical question for the analytic philosophers, Sartre, or theology to decide. But if you did not grow up in extreme situations, then it is easy to think that only a specific type of person could develop a revolting and perverse outlet for getting their jouissance, much less to judge this type as evil or a lost cause. What's easier is to consume information about such people because the disgust felt internally supports the unspoken. Well, at least I'm not like that. Spotting and condemning evil is always the favorite habit of a person who needs moral superiority on the cheap. It is no surprise then that cancel culture, virtue signaling, or performative wokeness, which also gets called weaponized identity politics, have become so popular in countercultural spaces. If you cannot transgress any further than Gigi Allen, and this causes a serious split in the countercultural movement, then the formerly repressed social superego and big other are doomed to return with a vengeance, this time under auspices of righteousness. Subcultural spaces that style themselves as transgressive and countercultural celebrate themselves as having a special monopoly on seeing the contradictions of the mainstream status quo, however that is defined. They also become sites of roiling, disavowed contradiction themselves, scenes that are founded on rejection of, resentment toward, and reaction against the big other and or its social superego lend themselves to res resentiment, which takes on different forms regardless of whether we mean Gigi Allen or Gerard Way of My Chemical Romance. Death Drive manifests in two main ways in underground scenes. Those who take the rejection of social norms to the non-sustainable and unsurpassable extreme, and then the consequential, re consequential return of the repressed superego. Shock rock, hardcore punk, and gangster rap in the 90s was followed by an explosion of hypersensitive, woke artists. Both of these forms of transgression are nonetheless inherent transgression, meaning they are easily incorporated into the status quo. Both are simultaneously sources of jouissance and resentiment. Resentiment, to be pronounced in a pretentiously French-sounding way, is the experience of virtue felt by turning one's vices into strengths. Nietzsche first discovered resentiment, theorizing it as slave morality. The slave, having no power to conquer the master, much less courage to take his own life, instead does mental gymnastics to invert the master's moral order. The master says, I am good because I am the winner, the stronger, the ruler. The slave's unconscious says, well, if I cannot be good by the definition of that value framework, then I will in invert the value framework and celebrate passivity, nonviolence, or subtle forms of resistance that are the opposite of whatever is valued by the master. Weakness is therefore strength, and winning in a corrupt world is losing one's soul. It is too easy to turn one's outsider status into a virtue. Because we couldn't make it in high school, we consider those who were diligent and successful in others in their studies sellouts. Because we couldn't see a future in academia for ourselves, we resent the professional manager managerial class, the PMC. Because we are outsiders, dropouts, autodidacts, we see ourselves as somehow enlightened and above the bullshit. More concerning is the tendency to celebrate transgression for its own sake. Hardcore punk and rap are divided between politically conscious messages and what seems like a stream of conscious chant and what seems like a stream of conscious channeling of the id. The vengeance of the repressed, the taking on and performing of the stereotypes put on us by others, the glorification of self-destruction and violence toward others. The tendency for ideology critique when it comes to underground or independent music is to analyze music for its conformity or for its explicit ideological messages. Stick to your guns and immortal technique are taken to be politically conscious and cutting edge, whereas a mirror in the, in the buffet boys are seen as merely reproducing the ideology of toxic masculinity and capital, capitalist accumulation. Or in the case of positive hardcore, posicore, a band like No Bragging Rights is seen as just self-help 
because they are not political enough, as though music can be more than medicine for mood modulation. The scene becomes a site of fixation on explicit content, on political messages articulated, or critiques of the people who represent supposed movements or ideas. None of this gets to the level of critique we aim to take things at Theory Underground, i.e. jouissance, result de mal, and death drive. All as forms of consumerism that are fully invested in the reproduction of capital. The fact is, on its own, music has no radical potential whatsoever. Artists sell us ways of coping. They might even help you break out of a rut, but they are also more likely to help you feel comfortable in your ruts. They sell us niche belonging. They make us feel special and different because we subscribe to something that does or says something that insults the sensibilities of those we dislike. If we're being honest, music is just something to listen to and enjoy. It is not going to overthrow capitalism or pave the way forward for something genuinely new. But of course, the left is full of people who come from punk or were inspired by it. Lots of activists and intellectuals got radicalized by political music, or at least appreciate the idea of underground scenes. No wonder the left is a boutique phenomenon, and no wonder most theory critique of music focuses on the letter of what's being said, as opposed to the level of enjoyment that is operative. Oliver Anthony's song, Rich Men North of Richmond, is being judged by many on the left for failing to critique structurally or theoretically enough, i.e. for apparently taking a pot shot at people on welfare just as much as he blames the elite. This is right-wing populism. That is a dead end, according to leftists, including Slavoj Žižek, whose article on Anthony is titled, Oliver Anthony Does Not Have the Answers. Right-wing protest songs only benefit the wealthy and powerful. Never mind that. When the right-wingers at the first GOP presidential primary debate tried to appropriate Anthony's image as a symbol, hold on, Anthony's image as a symbol for their Republican cause, Anthony responded by laughing about how ironic it was to see them do that, considering the fact that the song was about them. I saw that video thanks to Eamon, aka the Swolitariat, a contributor to this volume. When Eamon shared Anthony's song, his, when, when Eamon shared Anthony's disavowal of the Republican politicians, he made a point about how Anthony's song is just populist, not class conscious. What Swole and Zizek, as well as so many others, including Zach and Gavin at the Vanguard, all fail to realize <laughs> is that music is just meant to express what's going on and how one feels. But instead of vibing with the moment, they use their education-based privilege to write off a popular song that expresses genuine class antagonisms by holding it to a standard that should be reserved for politicians, influencers, and the rest of the PMC. Oliver Anthony's song is relatable to anyone who feels like their whole life force, time energy, is getting used up in return for shit wages, while rich and poor alike sit around and talk shit or ignore altogether from the sidelines. The left that cannot honor and dignify this core experience, while guiding it towards more productive ends, is the same left that has died. The left is dead and we have killed it. Just kidding, I don't believe we have that kind of power. Look, I love you guys, but your knee-jerk dismissal and downplaying of Oliver Anthony's heartbreaking song about having to go to work and knowing everything is bullshit is indicative of everything wrong with how we criticize things. The materialist left, the materialist left's trashing on Anthony was similar in attitude and mode to those cringe lord Twitter people who dunked on this book because they didn't like the graphic design or thought one or more of the authors was problematic. I think a lot of this is rooted in a smug and elitist form of enjoyment that gets Jewissons holding a blue-collar musician up to the standard by which one would judge an actual theorist or person of privilege. As though music needs to sound like Lennon, or as if Lennon would have been so dismissive in the event that a song like Richmond, North of Richmond, goes viral. Any serious leader or representative of the working class would have, as Michael Downs pointed out in personal conversation, finessed the situation, appealing to the sentiment stirred up. I know people who cried when they heard that song. You guys don't realize it, but you're pissing on something that is very special to the hardest working people I know, the ones who grow your food, build your houses, and move it from point A to point B. People like us need our copology, even if it is cut with a little simplistic populism every once in a while. How I, I want my copology cup with a little bit of populism. A little bit of populism. A little bit of populism on the side. Hold on, where the fuck is it? 
So what's the potential of theory underground, or underground theory, for that matter? If music doesn't have a real large-scale structural change potential, what about underground, th underground theory? I'm not sure, but it seems different, important, and new that working class people and dropouts are tuning into big ideas and thinking critically about things. But though it seems that way, couldn't it also be just another niche consumer demographic, a circle jerk at the end of history? It is too soon to tell. Underground theory is a new phenomenon. Only time will tell whether this scene can develop into a fertile intellectual milieu capable of growing some kind of movement. Most of the collaborators in, in this book have their own ideas of what underground theory is and what might be its potential. My goal is not to get the last word on this, but to instead provoke up-and-coming underground theorists to think seriously about what it means. The main thing for now is this. Transgression for its own sake might be fun, but it is not to be glorified. The underground is not necessarily better than the above ground, and in fact, it relies on the mainstream against which it antagonizes, resists, or seeks to overthrow. The inspiration I take from underground music is the idea of doing things oneself. I love how in both underground punk and rap, everyone was in a band or solo project. Everyone was collaborating. Everyone was always pushing their art. I love how in the hardcore music scene especially, bands like Black Flag, Mission for Burma, and Minor Threat were touring the country, going to small towns, staying for a week sometimes, playing the same sets over and over again, day after day, connecting with regular people who are sick and tired of being fed the same thing over and over again on the radio. I take inspiration from the underground ethos of resisting the incentives of a system that wants me to pump out overproduced garbage that says nothing and does nothing that feels real, all for profit and fame. I take inspiration from the idea that I would rather die than sell out to a system that doesn't care about art, love, or the intellect. At the same time, instead of fetishizing the grotesque or celebrating self-destruction and suicide, my goal has been to always put the positive spin on it. What is the life worth living? What does that look like? How do we make it happen? <laughs> World famous Tommies. It's a burger, burger place. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, considering the fact that we have that we live in a distracted, information saturated days, age, I think understanding concepts and philosophy are essential. Because the university as an institution is in decline, there really is nowhere to go for those of us seeking radical growth. To that end, I take inspiration from the punk DIY ethos of doing things oneself. I know Adorno had a lot of scorn for this idea, and he should know because he definitely benefited from his full-time administrative staff, but he was also a domesticated house cat of a failing university system. He definitely didn't see the potential for learning webs that we have today. I think technology has gotten us to the point where solo projects can prove a radical form of praxis. Learning webs of solo projects, collaboration, and a DIY scene. The status quo is not static, it is change itself. This is not pure progress or regression, but it is a complex set of tendencies and forces tangled up in a complex system that goes far beyond anything any of us are capable of comprehending. Yet we all have our sense for whether the general movement of history is positive or negative. This comes from our basic mood, perhaps, our fundamental disposition, the spirit of the times we are tapped into. In either case, it is probably pure ideology. Because we have some kind of a conception of why or how things are shitty and how they could be better, or of why we're utterly fucked no matter what, it is worthwhile to turn to philosophy and theory to deconstruct our presuppositions and biases so as to better hone in on the essence of the major tendencies playing themselves out. To understand the tendencies of the current situation will give us a sense for how to counteract or ride those tendencies in ways that help us make some kind of difference, if not for the whole world, then at least for our own survival. I think part of the point of living the examined life so that one can adjust expectations and strategies so as to lead a less miserable existence. Authors and underground theorists in this work, such as Brian Weeks, Ann Snowgrow, and L. Last, Philip Shin, are keen on the fact that the institutions are failing us, that the existing system has no real future, and that we have to either take collective or at least personal action so as to break from its general inertia. We want to hack our way through the existing systems into something freer. What we want is freedom, but we also need structures. The structures exist, but are being mirrored and borrowed off of in uncritical ways that undermine the radical potential of levers. Levers are those who exit the academic institutions. Angela Nagel said that we are likely to see mass levers from universities the same way we have from mainstream media. One vulnerability 
PMC has is people of quality voluntarily leaving if the conditions allow it. An economically viable exit strategy that allows greater freedom, which is already happening in media, could conceivably happen in other institutions like academia if someone figures out the right model. How long will PMC prestige last, the only thing they have to sell, if all the best scholars and thinkers that people want to hear from and they come up with new innovations leave and then use their years of pent-up frustration to expose the institutional rot from the outside, as some breakaway figures are doing with the media today. A year or so after writing the above piece, Nagel appeared as a guest on What's Left podcast. In the conversation, she references Justin Murphy as a solid example of this academic exit strategy. In my first book, Waypoint, I also suggested that Justin Murphy might be an example of a radical alternative to the current academic situation. I like the idea of academics going their own way. The issue is that academics need administration, so they trade out their university's admin for a platform. The goal with Theory Underground is to not be reliant on any of the platforms, but to have my own. When academics become free from the university, they are too easily turned into functionaries of the attention economy. Seduced by the platform's algorithms, we become little more than influencers. I used to be one. I felt its effect on me. The medium is not just the message, it also makes the messenger. Political streamers like Bosch, Destiny, and Hassan, and Hassan are the medium. <laughs> they are the algorithms personified. <laughs> Genuine learning can be obtained to some degree on one's own, but structures are necessary to coordinate efforts between lots of people. And lots of people, ideological diversity, and a robust plurality in the discourse of truth seekers are all necessary grounds for overly corporate and risk averse spaces to become unique and potent places. Non-belongers need to leave the non-places to experiment with making their own places for robust networks. Ivan Illich, in Schooling Society, proposes that learning webs could be the solution to break from the model of compulsory schooling that has done so much to undermine genuine education. What would that look like? Not a podcast, not an individual brand, nor a learning cooperative either. What we need are a million experiments. Instead, most leavers do nothing to genuinely counter the tendencies of the attention economy or truly experiment with the technological means at our disposal. Thaddeus Russell calls his podcast Renegade University, but it's just a podcast. Justin Murphy says he started a liberal arts college, but it was really just some one-off courses that are not available on demand after the fact, so once he burnt out, it went away. Nor was it obvious that they were part of a coherent and grander vision for fostering the conditions necessary for a community of truth seekers, much less cutting edge theorists. Rather than just sit on the sidelines and nitpick at other people's experiments, I wanted to do all of the things I wished someone else would try. Universities may be here to stay, but there is a possible future wherein those who have exited do the work to counter both the worst tendencies of the university and the attention economy. By showing that the bureaucratic blood, commercialization, and censorship at universities are unnecessary and can be dispensed with, we prove what is possible. This will force change, but instead of doing anything that can do that, leavers get seduced by the algorithmic incentives of the attention economy and become edgy culture warrior content pumping machines. The contradictions in the university have led to an explosion of new projects as individuals leave the institutions and new groups form. But those groups become new institutions that, in their own ways, mirror the worst tendencies of what they have exited. The thing is, I owe a tremendous debt to all of those who have courageously attempted to do something different. In the same way I see things that I want to correct for, there will be people like Michal Rams Legowski in this book will have critiques of how centralized theory underground is. I guess this just comes down to a difference in perspective because I don't think small media projects are effective when decentralized. For instance, those who have tried to unionize, collectivize, or democratize current affairs or the Young Turks, or even a small business like Mina's World or a pizza shop in downtown Boise, completely miss that such singular entities built around individual personalities and their networks would exist in any ideal society. The point is, not, the point is to not let them rule the world, of course, but if people don't have the freedom to do what they want on an expanded scale, then it wouldn't be a society worth living in. Yet decentralization is upheld as a supreme value. I just do not think of them as effective or fun. All of the existing alternative theory education organizations I have seen so far are no exception. Most courses are in fact little more than discussion groups. 
their on-demand content is mostly just people name dropping, free associating, and assuming everyone else gets it, all without any way of providing introductory on-demand courses, accountability, and assessment structures, or a way to keep the discourse going on after the fact in spaces dedicated to the specific subject matter. These are all tendencies Theory Underground aims to counter, though I'm sure the failures will be myriad. Hopefully my failures will inspire others to do better than me. Every Lieber sees what needs to be fixed in different ways, understanding the problems in their own terms. I think any genuinely robust movement would be made up of hundreds of singular experiments doing things that nobody in existing institutions would have ever dreamed of doing. This way, this is why I am for one-person colleges in a network of what even Illich called learning webs. Learning webs don't need boards. Lear learning webs don't need massive funding or big teams. Those only slow things down with administrative nonsense and more interpassive knowledge games where nobody does the work because everyone else supposedly did it already. Where everyone takes ownership for each accomplishment so nobody makes their own. In a world where everything is always falling apart and accelerating, what we need are the kinds of structures that help us corral certain flows of energy, interest, and research into contained spaces that are themselves considered experiments dedicated to specific outcomes. If in the 60s the idea was that everyone knows enough and we don't need lectures, just flipped classrooms and dropping out to tune in, today we need the opposite, lectures that assume an audience supposed to have done the reading and be confused. Anything less lowers the bar and we have nothing genuinely worth tackling to rise against. In the original version of this book, there were going to be a lot more of my writings theorizing the underground. I've written a few pieces that critique tendencies that are fostered by the attention economy that are ultimately self-undermining for underground theorists. For anyone interested in countering self-defeating tendencies in themselves when it comes to doing philosophy on the internet, I recommend Three Principles of Study as a Way of Life and Mastery versus Students Supposed to Know. For now, those are available on, theory, on the Theory Underground website. They will be published in a future volume. Suffice it to say, I am very critical of my own tendency to take the easy way out. These articles are meant to get me to step up my game, but hopefully encourage fellow travelers to do so as well. Most of what leavers do hardly takes advantage of what's truly possible. They fail to make their own learning platforms and instead get seduced by the attention awarded to influencers by the distraction economy. The solution is to instead become genuine participants in learning webs. Genuinely cutting edge learning webs will probably look like professors being one person colleges confederated in a larger underground DIY scene where genuine discourse is engaged in over decade, where genuine discourse is engaged in over decades and real contradictions get fleshed out over time. To do this, we don't need more boards. The administration can be replaced by AI. We aren't quite there yet, which is why we need people like me to experiment with juggling virtually all aspects of the operation simultaneously. What I bring to the dynamic is absurd amounts of obsessive energy and being just good enough at a lot of different things to pull off essentially building a one-person college that is both online and offline, has its own social media platform and app, is independent of corporate and state sponsorship, and even has a publishing house. As I said, <coughs> AI will replace most of the administrative bullshit, but for now, people who, who can DIY the whole thing are needed. I consider myself an experiment in what one person can accomplish. Those who are interested in what's going to be possible in the very near future are already taking note. With all that said though, it's of course not just me. I have collaborated with everyone in this volume. I have co-taught courses and everything I have accomplished relies on the buy-in from at least 20 to 50 pretty dedicated and obsessive fellow travelers. Nothing I would have, nothing I do would have ever been possible without Brian Weeks, Michael Downs, Elton O.K., and Ann Snellgrove. The same goes for Bryce Nance, the one student who has taken all of my courses so far. You guys make it possible, for real, because otherwise I'd just be talking to myself. My point is simply that none of my fellow travelers need to concern themselves with administrative nonsense. None of them have to build the website and keep it up to date. Everyone gets to use the course-gated social media site without having to worry about all the WordPress plugins it requires, the constant troubleshooting, and all the rest of the developer nightmares that I have undertaken as a daily chore for these last six months. In the future, I think we will all be able to have what I have with Theory Underground. A network from our own little course site items, or in the theme of neo-feudalist realism, we'll all have our own fiefdoms, without having to worry about all this administrative and developer bullshit that I am currently wrestling with every day. But why do I feel the need to make it what it is? A lecture course-gated 
social media site and publishing house is meant to counter the fact that all spaces online are non-places where mere chatter lowers the bar ever further while making us feel like something has been achieved. Philosophy and theory being mixed with courses on practical living and diverse subject matters, coupled with principles from language learning communities, is meant to counter how all the above have lost something special in isolation from one another. By utilizing gamification, social media, and YouTube in strategic ways, I hope we are able to counter the worst tendencies of the attention economy while doing something that matters. Ways of using the master's tools that become beneficial. Something, something. I hate this paragraph. Whatever. I get more into this stuff in the article on three principles. The three principles of study as a way of life. The point is to compensate with what positive manifestations expose as lacking while utilizing the tools and tendencies in the current situation to overcome its worst dynamics. Most of the worst tendencies are ones that we feel every day, turning education into a form of social or cultural capital used to hoard virtue over working people while creating a prestige class of discursive Taylorism is one of the most noxious tendencies undermining any approximation of the idea of the university, exposing the PMC for its function in meritocracy virtue hoarding, division, and the overall reproduction of class society has therefore been put front and center with everything TU does. And I defend my use of this term PMC against the cheap and dogmatic dismissals in my piece within this volume called Lefter Than Now. Likewise, the tendency to challenge reifications of the two-party, two-ideology, two-side lesser evilist establishment, in a word duopoly, and all the alternative, indie, and lever spinoffs who bear it, has been central to theory underground. We have experimented with horizontalism and group collaboration enough for a hundred years. What is needed now are trees with rhizomatic root systems, islands with strong shipping routes, and micro-dictatorships with reliable rail systems between city-states. There was a time when I used the term we instead of I in some kind of way that deflected attention from the subject of enunciation. Now I'll just say it, my unique combination of functions and experiments and the mode of this new medium won't be seen outside of Theory Underground for at least a decade. I believe its singular value will prove out. Educators having their own apps, their own platforms, their own networks is new, and I think it's the most exciting thing ever. I believe that doing stuff like this will spark radical imagination for others by showing them what is plausibly within reach. There are those who are scared of anything singular. They want the universe they want universality only, and they see anything singular as particular only. What they forget is that we are all potentially singular, and that a robust dialectic between particular and universal is necessary to hone singularity, and vice versa. If the punk scene was made up of leavers and rejects who all had their own DIY projects, then underground theorists and renegade academics who give a shit about combating the worst tendencies of a class society while experimenting with alternatives need to learn how to build their own platforms, corral their own interests, and contain conversations in a way that moves them from the plane of non-places into bases from which to develop structures into the realm of hype. The goal of Theory Underground is to see what can be done in five years, with the plan being that anyone who gets seriously involved will also receive a crash course in how to do it themselves. What I hope will come from this is a whole lot of other experiments. I'm going to be transparent about funding, the budget, and tools used. Anyone else will be ostensibly able to achieve more using less because I will have done the work when it was more costly and difficult. I'll set up a course eventually to show others how to do it themselves. Everyone in this volume is experimenting with these new frontiers and possibilities in their own ways. This book was originally going to be just a collection of my own essays and some of Michael Down's blog posts, but when Slavoj Zizek told me he was going to give me a manuscript to publish, I decided to invite some fellow travelers and renegade academics to participate. I did not expect that most of the people I asked for submissions would actually follow through. I expected that only half would follow through. Instead, they all did. So this is a huge volume. No apologies. The material in this volume spans a lot of topics and is composed of many different styles. The content has been carefully selected and combined to be read as a whole. What matters more than people's takes or positions is the subject matter itself all of which will be the basis for future courses, conferences, and conversations. This is where under, underground theory really gets started. What you're holding in your hands is the product of a whole lot of research, consideration, passion, and fun. I admire all of the people in this volume for different reasons and in different ways, and am proud to call them fellow travelers. I hope that, whether you were reading or listening to this book, 
you find something in it life-changing for the better. I hope it inspires you to think and write your own for yourself. Maybe you'll even end up taking some Theory Underground courses. Or we will meet up on tour. Either way, I look forward to either talking about this work with you or at least hearing your thoughtful reflections on its chapters via the form shared throughout the volume. In conclusion, I would just like to say, welcome to the underground. Let's get started. Bing bong. Bing bong, bing bong. There we go, we did it. Good job, man. Yeah, man. Killed it. Always. Yeah, me too.